You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. I wanted to start by asking you to imagine the perfect human being in various roles. Physically, you might think of someone like the Jamaican runner, Usain Bolt, the fastest human ever. Intellectually, you may think of someone like Stephen Hawking, a brilliant physicist. And morally, you might think of someone like Mother Teresa or Martin Luther King, who led peaceful movements for human rights and freedoms and improved the lives of so many. If we were to imagine the perfect human, we would probably include the elements that made these men and women so successful in their endeavours. Thankfully, though, God's idea of a perfect human is very different to ours. So he sent Jesus Christ, who the Bible tells us was the only perfect human. So... Our aim in these three short segment talks is to present the Bible's view of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, As this by no means accurate autoscale graph shows, we'll be discussing Jesus Christ, the man who walked the earth 2,000 years ago, right through to the immortal king who will rule the earth in the future kingdom of God. As we cover this vast time frame, we also hope to demonstrate the truth of the words written to the Hebrew ecclesia of the very first century. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. In these segments, we'll see the Lord Jesus Christ throughout time and across varied roles. We'll see him in different circumstances, across his change of nature from mortal to immortal. But the beautiful character of Jesus Christ remains the same. And that is what we'll explore in this first section. Christ's life can be separated into four main events or three categories. Um, In Luke 2 verse 4, um, we have his birth in Bethlehem. and, And that first segment is his birth and childhood, 0 to 12 years. In Luke 2, verse 42, his decision to be about his father's business came at around 12 years old, um, and that is the start of his pre-ministerial adulthood, 12 to 30 years. In Luke 3, verse 23, we have his baptism at 30, um, and then his ministry um, from about 30 to 33 and a half, with three Passovers recorded during the Gospels, and then the one at which he was killed. As this was an annual feast, we can conclude his ministry went for three to four years. And then in Luke 23, verse 46, we have recorded a young death. So to start with, his birth. His birth is a pretty well-known story due to the Christmas tradition that commonly enacts some of these details. But the important points to note are that A, God was his father, and B, His mission was set out from birth that he would save his people from their sins. And while we'll touch on some of those messages tonight that Christ gave in his later ministry about this, um, the second speaker, Brad, will really cover off how he did this when discussing his death and the impact of that. We don't know all that much about his childhood, Um, Apart from the fact that his family spent a few years in Egypt to keep him safe from the Herod of the time, Um, and then they moved back to Nazareth, where the family had originally come from. We also, uh, we know a little bit about his pre-ministerial adulthood. Um, The Lord grew up in Nazareth. Um, The next thing we hear of him is, is 12 years old, and is in Jerusalem with the family for a feast. They end up accidentally leaving him behind, thinking that he is among uh, the group or the caravan of people headed back. But upon realising, they rush back to try and find him, and they find him in the temple of God, talking about God with the elders of the day. And already at this age, at only the age of 12, 
He has a very strong idea of what his purpose in life is. Luke 2 verse 49 records, He said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Essentially, he's saying, Why did it take you so long to find me? Surely you knew I'd be here. My number one priority is God's mission for me. And we'll see in a minute that this continued on throughout his ministry. We also know from interactions he had uh, later in his life that he had four half-brothers and at least two sisters for whom he likely had responsibility. (coughs) His mother's husband, Joseph, was a carpenter. Um, And he's called a few times the carpenter's son. So we assume that to some level he worked with Joseph in his carpentry business in Nazareth. Um, And then at the age of 30, he came down to Judea to his cousin John, commonly referred to as John the Baptist, who had been sent by God to baptise people for the remission of their sins, doing so in the preparation of the coming of Jesus. Jesus himself is baptised in the River Jordan by John to show that this was the way that God had appointed to salvation. Christ's baptism then kick-started his public life, where we might say his influence began to be seen. He was, he was a wandering preacher and teacher, and he largely travelled between Galilee in the north and Jerusalem in mid-south. He performed incredible miracles, including healing mental illnesses, healing leprosy, healing paralysis, walking on the Sea of Galilee, turning just a few loaves of bread into a feast for five and 4,000 people, respectively. And most remarkable of all, on a few occasions, even raising people to life again after being, um, after being dead. And that included one person who had been dead for four days plus. But his influence was not merely physical displays of healing. His influence was to people's heart, and the message that he taught was simple, and powerful, because it was clear that he lived every word that he spoke. He never asked others to do things that he himself wasn't prepared to do. Most of his teachings and his life can be summarized by what he called the two greatest commandments given in the Old Testament. Come with me quickly to Matthew chapter 22, um, and we'll read from verse 35 where he outlines these two commandments. Matthew 22, verse 35, and we'll read through to 39. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. So Christ taught these things throughout his ministry um, by calling out hypocrisy in worship and celebrating true worship. We see that in the quote there from Luke 21, verse 1 to 4, um, speaking of the difference between the rich casting gifts into the treasury and the widow who cast in two mites. He says, Of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the, offering, unto the offerings of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. Christ also lived this, as we see on um, the right there, in Matthew 26, verse 42, um, praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, Except I drink it, thy will be done. He also showed uh, the second commandment, love your neighbour as yourself. Christ taught this um, where uh, where he um, shows that fellow humans in need are our neighbour and that you should care for them just as God and Christ have cared for us. 
Um, and the example there um, in Luke 10 is of a Samaritan man who got beaten on the roadside. Uh, sorry, a man who got beaten on the roadside. And the Samaritan, the least likely man, helped him. Christ also lived this, an example from John 15, where he says, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And Brad will soon show us that Christ did exactly this. He laid down his life to save those who are his friends. He showed the greatest love possible to us all. Come with me finally um, as we wrap up to John uh, chapter 8. Here we see a great example of a situation in which he showed both, both his love for God and his love for fellow humans. The scribes and the Pharisees, who were rulers at the time, hated that he frequently called um, their motivations and their practices into question. So they constantly asked him questions, um, trying to trap him. One day, bringing him someone who had been caught in adultery, which was and is against God's law. Therefore, it is a sin. And they asked him what they should do. And he said, in verse 7, He that is without sin among you, Let him first cast a stone at her. And he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. And he continues in, um, he goes goes on to say to the woman in verse 10, When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. But Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. This shows both mercy and love for God and his ways. Christ had found both a way to show mercy or love to this woman while upholding the purity of God's laws. By showing this woman mercy, she would now have opportunity to show her gratitude in love and obedience to God. (coughs) (coughs) The teachings of Jesus were many and varied, but they all followed these themes of genuine love for God and his ways, and then a demonstration of this love for others. This is what his life was dedicated to. And the incredible way his influence spread remains today. As you now hear about his death, and then the future that he's promised us, just reflect, as we go through these, just reflect on how much you'd like to allow the life of Jesus Christ to influence your life. Let's jump straight into our topic tonight. Um, Up on the screen we have a very common or recognisable universal symbol. It's one that the world knows everywhere throughout the world. It's a cross and it's something that is used commonly in identifying Christian organisations for the whole whole world over. And it's something that is very well known and it's very much associated with the death of one man and the man who we come here to talk about tonight, that of our Lord Jesus Christ. For a lot of churches, the cross is something of very high importance. It's often used in their decoration and it's used externally as a symbol on their venues and it's a symbol that they place a high amount of importance on. But I suppose for us as Bible students, that is, the symbol of the cross is but a very, is a part of why we think this man, Jesus Christ, is so important. Hence why this evening we're doing a series on three very distinct, very separate parts of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ 
And as Micah has so, so well shown for us, this man, Jesus Christ, he was special. He was an amazing man. Um, he was truly the biggest and, and, and the, the greatest influencer that the world has ever known. So many influences we see in the world today. Uh, but Jesus Christ was the best. And we look forward to Anthony continuing on uh, after myself in showing how his influence is going to be continuing again into the future in his session. But for the people that were living in the time of Christ, his death had a huge impact or would have had a huge impact. It was something that they would have experienced. They would have experienced the horror of this crucifixion, the brutality, the shame that was brought upon in such a, such a death. And the violent nature of his crucifixion on the cross was something that those people that experienced it would have had to live with for the rest of their life and it would have been absolutely memorable. Forever this, this event would have been burnt into their memories. But what does it mean for you and me sitting here this evening? What does it mean for us here tonight, 2,000 or so years later on? So hopefully in the next few minutes what we're going to be able to show is that it does uh, have a great importance and we'll get a taste of what it means. It means a heck of a lot. It means a massive amount and it's of the uttermost importance for each one of us in hall here this evening. Now as we know, Micah has told us that Christ's life was amazing. We saw that. And he mentioned that his life was one of perfect obedience to the laws of his God in, in heaven or his Father. That's a given, we know that. But for us to truly appreciate the reason for the Lord Jesus Christ's death, we need to go back all the way back to the beginning of time, to the very start of the Bible, all the way back into the book of Genesis, to fully appreciate the reason that he had to die and what his death actually accomplished for each one of us sitting here this evening. I want you to take your thoughts all the way back to the beginning, to the Garden of Eden. God has just created an amazing world. He's put effort in. His angels have created it. It's a wonderful man. He's created man and woman. He's given everything they wanted. Everything that they could have desired is given to them in this garden. And man and woman in this garden are living in what we describe as a limbo state. They weren't living forever, but they also weren't mortal dying creatures either. And God had created the world in a state which we're going to describe tonight as as a very, very good state. So what I want to do is we're going to get this little bit of blue tack on here and we're going to put very good state at the top of our board up here. All right, so God's created this world in a very good state and he gives Adam and Eve a very simple law. He tells them that they could eat of all the trees in the garden, they could do whatever they wanted, look after the animals, but they weren't allowed to eat of one particular tree, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Very simple law. Very, very simple. And God said simply that they, if they did eat of this tree, if they choose to eat of this tree, that they would die. Well, as we know as humans, what do we do? When humans get involved in things, things generally go wrong. And these humans, Adam and Eve, they couldn't help themselves and they ate of the fruit. They disobeyed God's command, the one command that he gave them, the only command that he gave them, they disobeyed and they sinned and they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So what we're going to do is going to put up on our board the fact that they sinned. I'm going to put that here. So Adam and Eve did something wrong and they sinned. Now you tell me, what should have God done in this instance? What should have God done? Should he have backed down? Should he have not gone through with the promise? Well, you wouldn't parent your children that way and I wouldn't try not to parent my children that way. So actually God had to go through with his promise. He went through with his promise and to Adam and Eve, because of their sin, he condemned them to death. As a result of their sin, the consequences of their sin, it resulted in their death. So what we're going to do is we're going to put death up on this board here, right down the bottom. All right, so we can see what's happening there. There's a progression. Now, they weren't to die straight away. It wasn't going to be an instant death. But they, now, all of a sudden, Adam and Eve were no longer in this wonderful limbo state that God had created for them. They were, in fact, slowly decaying mortal creatures. They'd got themselves into a proper mess because of their sin, because of their disobedience of the one commandment that God gave them. Try to put yourself in God's shoes, if we can. He's just made this wonderful creation. He's given them one commandment. And his humans that he created, the people that he loved dearly, have absolutely gone and made an absolute mess of everything 
that he'd set out to create. This wasn't the idea that God had set out to create. Well, what does God do? Well, he kicks them out of his garden. He bars the entrance, he kicks them out of the garden, he gives a, a whole series of punishments onto Adam and Eve, no less the greatest punishment that we've just got up on our board there of the fact that they were now to die. Adam and Eve now are becoming dying mortal creatures, just like me and you. Just like me and you. Which is interesting, because we are dying mortal creatures, but yet we were not the ones that have eaten of the fruit. And we might think that's unfair. Well, the book of Romans tells us the reason why we're dying mortal creatures. The book of Romans tells us this. It says, Wherefore... As by one man, sin, uh, one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passes on all men, for that all have sinned. Now we may think it's unfair that we die now because Adam and Eve sinned. Well, no, we die now because we are humans and we also sin also. We all die. And the reason that we all die is because every single one of us in this hall this evening has sinned. Every single human being that has been produced by two other human beings has sinned. And it's illogical for us to think that two imperfect people could produce a perfect offspring. It's very illogical to think that. All right, so let's come back to the board behind us. God has a problem. His creation haven't listened and that they've thrown the whole future of mankind on its out of his axis and it's all out of kilter and humanity is essentially now heading down, as we can see on our board, on this slippery slope to eternal death. And this wasn't God's plan. This was not God's plan. And, God, and so God moves, he gets, comes into action, he moves to right the wrong that the humans have created. And the way that he does this is he gets someone involved, and that is his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the subject of our talk this evening. So what we're going to do is we're going to put on our board an alternative. We're going to put our, the Lord Jesus Christ here. We have an option. There's, a, there's another plan. The antidote for humans messing things up is told for us in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22. We're told that for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made Alive. See, what we're told here is that all humans require to die because all humans were all human. Even the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, was required to die as he too was a descendant of Adam. We're all descendants of Adam, me, you, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And as in Adam, we're told, all die. Now, I want you to take your minds back to the statement that I made just before. It's a true statement. It is illogical to think that two imperfect people can produce a perfect offspring and that's true and so God in his grand plan of righting the wrong which humankind has done sets about to make this right I want you to turn with me if your Bibles are open to the book of Romans and Romans chapter 5 and we're just going to skim the service here this evening please take the time to read it this section in Romans chapter 5 in your own time and follow along as we read from verse 18 of Romans 5 it's on the screen if you don't have a Bible handy we read that, therefore, as by the offence of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. All right, so we have something else now that we can put on our chart behind us. We have an option of justification of life. We have life as an option now. It used to be only death now. If we want to put it up here, we have the option of life right up the top. Okay, so if we read this again, therefore, as by the offence of one, Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, that's fair. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we've got our secondary option, the righteousness of one, the free gift comes on all men unto the justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, the Lord Jesus Christ, many 
be made righteous. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. It's very repetitious, isn't it? Because of one man's sin, we die, but because of another man's actions, we have a chance of life. Now, that's a game changer. That's a game changer. That's what we're here to discuss this evening. Just as we were made sinners and ultimately mortal, we're told here in the book of Romans that we have an out, that we have a get-out clause, we have another option. And this get-out clause is none other, as we can see on our screen behind us, as the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the Lord Jesus Christ, as Mike has shown us, he wasn't a normal human being. He was someone amazing. He was born of a woman, his mother Mary. But more importantly, he was the son of God. He was born of God. He was the son of a woman, but also the son of God. And from his mother, he inherited our nature. In the book of Hebrews 2 verse 14, we're told, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood... He himself, Christ, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. And in Hebrews 4 verse 5 we're told further, For we have not a high priest, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He experiences the same things we experience, the same struggles and sufferings. But he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he never sinned. That's the difference. From two imperfect human beings, you could never have a perfect human being. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, we had Christ as the son of a woman, Mary, and also the son of God. Born of a woman, but also the son of God. A man who had the same nature as us, and yet as Mike has shown us, he managed to live a perfect life. That's amazing. For 33 and a half years, the Lord Jesus Christ never sinned, never did anything wrong, never gave in to his human natural desires. Absolutely mind-blowing. And when we compare this back to the original characters that we looked at this evening, in Adam and Eve, all they could fail was in eating some simple fruit. The contrast is very clear. But the question for us tonight is, okay, yes, we have seen how we, get ourselves, how we got ourselves as humans into this predicament that we're in. And we've sort of seen how that God has given us an out, get out clause in the Lord Jesus Christ as another option. But how actually does the death of the Lord Jesus Christ get us back on track? How actually does it happen? Well, it's through one very particular thing and one very specific thing, and it's through the blood of Jesus Christ himself. You know, we've got to be quick, but throughout the scripture, the shedding of blood is a theme that runs right through the Bible from the start to the finish. It's a principle threaded through the whole of the Bible. From all the way back, if we go back to Egypt, and we might remember the ten plagues that were on the, on the Egyptians and on the children of Israel. The very last plague of the killing of the firstborn, what the children of Israel had to do is they had to go out to their farm, select a lamb. It had to be a perfect lamb. They had to pen this lamb up and it had to monitor it for imperfections and see if there's any blemishes and make sure that this lamb was absolutely spot on perfect, no blemish. And at the end of the 14 days, they would kill this lamb, they would collect the blood, and they would paint the blood over the doorpost and over the lintels of their house. So when the angel of death came over that house on that particular night, in order to kill the firstborn, he would see the blood on the doorpost, and he would spare or protect those that were in that house. They were saved by the lamb's blood. And when we go back further in the scripture, all the way back to the book of Genesis, in the actual particular sin that Adam and Eve did, Adam and Eve were forgiven also in the covering, in the covering of uh, the blood of a lamb. God made the, killed a lamb and he made them garments out of the clothes and the blood was there for a covering. Once again, shed blood providing the covering for sin. And this was also reflected in the offerings that the Israelites had to offer throughout their wilderness wanderings. The shedding of blood, especially that of a lamb, was crucial to the forgiveness of sins and in order for reconciliation with God to occur. They're all signs pointing forward to the greatest lamb as a symbol, the perfect lamb, all pointing forward to this perfect lamb, this faultless lamb, which would be slain for the, for the forgiveness of sinners, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, was baptising people in a river one day and he saw Jesus coming towards him to be baptised. And he said something extremely specific when we reference back to the Lamb. He says, The next day John seeth 
Jesus coming unto him and he says, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. And in the book of Revelations, Jesus Christ is referred to as the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, referencing back to that incident in Genesis. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ that all of us here this evening have a chance of life. It's not a given. It's conditional on certain requirements, but we are given a chance, an opportunity, a way has been directed now through Jesus Christ that we can have a hope of life and if you're still in Romans chapter 5 take a look at verse 1 of Romans 5 therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God so through faith we read we can have peace with God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And importantly, access, access to grace or forgiveness. We are given a way to life. We are saved by grace. Well, if we're saved by grace, you may think, well, the sacrifice of Christ and the shed blood, then really we don't have to do anything else. That's, that's wonderful. Jesus has done it all. We can just continue on doing what we're doing, sinning as we're sinning, uh, and Jesus has sort of done everything we need to do. Well, that's completely not, the tr- not, not true because there's actual responsibility on each and every one of us. If you turn over to the second chapter in, in Romans chapter 6, Romans 6 has something to say, say about this. It says in Romans 6 verse 1, what shall we say? Then this is a question, essentially preempting what we've just said. Shall we just continue sinning because Jesus has done everything? No. The question is, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, a simple answer to that question is given in the following verse. Two words, God forbid. No, no, no. No, no no means. We cannot just continue sinning because we are covered by Christ. No way. The chapter goes on by saying that it is essential that we are baptised into Christ and that we are to live a life of obedience to the will of his Father just as Jesus Christ himself did. And that through serving God and not trying to serve ourselves for our own desires, we will fail, however. We can have forgiveness for our sins and be reconciled or made right to God, which ultimately brings us to the path of life eternal. So that's our time for tonight. Uh, Essentially, mankind, way back in the beginning, they messed things up. They got us on a path that was heading to death. But God fixed things up and he got us, brings us on a path back to life. It's a plan and a way that you too can be part of through baptism, through the sacrificial perfect life of his dear son, our Lord Jesus Christ, into the name of Jesus Christ. And if we live a life as best we can to the obedience of the will of God, we too can have a hope of the future. familiar with this word Christ and what it actually means. Uh, In Jewish times, people that were appointed to special roles were anointed as a symbol of the fact that they had been given authority and had been appointed to, to achieve a certain outcome. And there were three main roles that were required um, in, in, the, in the Jewish scriptures, which we read particularly in the Old Testament, where anointing was actually um, provided, which is that word Christ. The first of those was if a person was going to be a prophet or a teacher about God. That's really what Micah has already talked to us about, isn't it? How that the Lord Jesus Christ was the primary influencer and teacher or prophet, if you like, to teach people about God. What we just heard from Brad was the role of the Lord Jesus Christ as an anointed priest. He was one who came to be a mediator to bring peace, as we saw in one of those passages that Brad talked talked about, to bring peace between people and God. And so the Lord Jesus Christ had those roles of prophet. He had the role of the priest. 
And there was a third major role, as we look through the Old Testament Bible, uh, which, was, uh, which people were anointed for. And it's this role that we want to just talk a little bit about tonight. And we'll mention what it is in a little while. For the role of prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ was here on the earth. For his role as priest, he was here on the earth. And for this third role that we're going to talk about, he also has to be here on the earth. And so that's why, first of all, we want to talk about this idea of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to fulfill this role. Unfortunately, you know, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to back to this earth doesn't feature as prominently in those that would teach about the Lord Jesus Christ as it should. And so to make sure there's absolutely no doubt in your minds that there is every intention that the Lord Jesus Christ should actually return to this earth, let's just skip through a few passages of the scripture to help us understand that. Every major writer in the New Testament confirmed that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to come back and some others. You see, after the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, after the crucifixion that Brad was talking to us about, he stayed with the disciples for 40 days and then ascended to heaven. And while they were watching, no doubt open mouthed as he went into heaven, the angels came and spoke to them. You see this passage here in Acts chapter 1. When he had spoken these things, the Lord Jesus Christ, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which is the clue they were angels. And these said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So the angels that were there at the point when he left the earth gave the very first message. So those that were wondering why he was going away, don't worry, he's coming back. And as we've said, every major writer of the New Testament since has confirmed that. Peter said he would return in a speech that he gave publicly to the, Jews, uh, the Jewish people in his days as he was trying to influence them to be converted to the salvation that the Lord Jesus Christ would bring, he said this, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. And where was Jesus Christ going to be sent from? This is written after the Lord had gone into heaven. Well, Peter says, the heaven must receive him until a certain time, until the restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So Peter confirmed there in his public addresses that the Lord Jesus Christ would return. The Apostle Paul said multiple times, and you could find uh, many of them, dozens and dozens of them in his writings, but here he says to the Thessalonian believers, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. And while you're doing that service, you are waiting for his son from heaven. He's going to return because that son had been raised from the dead, even Jesus, which hath delivered us from the wrath to come. And Brad's given us that summary there on, on the board behind us. James said that he would return. Be patient, he said, therefore, brethren, there's work for you to do in this life. But be patient unto the coming of the Lord. There's got to be a lot of hard work required in your life. The husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. There'll be a time waiting for the rain, waiting for the fruit to grow. You've got to have long patience for it. Be patient like that, he says, and establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord will draw nigh. So James confirms for us uh, that he would return. John, the writer of the epistle of the, the, the gospel of John and three epistles confirms that. Now, little children, he said, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. John confirmed that he would return. Now, all of the major writers in the New Testament have confirmed for us that he would return. Um, the little epistle of Jude doesn't particularly re reference the, the coming of the Lord, 
But Jude introduced his writings by saying, look, I want to talk about our common salvation, but actually there's something more important for you right now that you have to get right. Uh, because with no doubt being concerned that the Lord uh, would, would not be happy with where they were. And in the final writings of our Bible, the book of the Revelation, which are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, he also confirmed that he would return. Revelation 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Not everybody will be expecting me. And I will be very happy with those that are watching and keeping their garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. I'm going to come. Are you going to be ready? That's his message. And at the end of Revelation 22 and verse 12, Behold, I come quickly or suddenly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So without question, the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. He's going to return to fulfill that third Christ role uh, that we've been leading up to. What was his purpose in return? Now, can I ask you to have a look in Luke chapter 1? Now, in doing so, we go right back to the beginning of the three addresses tonight to look at the time of his birth. In fact, even before that, to the time of the announcement that he was going to come. And the three verses, or four verses, that we're going to read now are the very first time that anybody knew the name that God was going to give his son. It's the very first time that anybody knew that somebody called Jesus would even come. And so we read here the, the message that the angel gave to Mary. John, uh, Luke chapter 1 and verse 30, The angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. You see how important that is. The translators in my Bible at least have written that all in capitals so that it stands out on the page. This is a special person. This is the first time that his name is announced. And here's his specialness. It's not that he's going to be able to run the 100 metres like Usain Bolt or any of those other features that Micah introduced us to. No, he's going to be great because he's going to be like his father. He shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And so at the very start of the introduction of Jesus in the world, even before he was born, the third of the anointed roles that we want to talk about today is highlighted. It's highlighted three times. In this passage, he's going to have a throne in verse 32. He's going to reign in verse 33 over a kingdom. And that means that he is going to be the anointed king. This is the third role that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to have and that which we are considering tonight. He's been the prophet or a teacher. He's been a priest in his, in his sacrificial role and he's now a mediator for us to bring peace with God. And he's going to return to be the king. Now, in case you're not sure that that was really a focus of his life, what we've just read here is the very first time his name was even introduced. Let's go to some of the very last words that he spoke uh, before he was crucified. And these are in John chapter 18. Let's be clear that this is precisely why he is going to return to take up this role as king. Now in John chapter 18, he was before the most important and powerful person that there was in that whole region. Pontius Pilate was the direct authority of Caesar in that region. And he knew what authority he had and where he had got it from, did Pontius Pilate. And, the, and the, the call that had come or the charge that had come about the Lord Jesus Christ was that he was trying to set himself up as king. And of course there couldn't be another king. Pontius Pilate had to support the authority and the rulership of the existing king or Caesar. And so he's questioning the Lord Jesus Christ about his credentials. John 18 and verse 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus... And said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? 
Jesus answered him, saying, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Is this something you've just dreamed up, or is this part of the charge that's been laid against me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Don't give me questions. Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What have you done? You reckon that you're called the king of the Jews? What have you done that your nation, if you're the king of the Jews, has delivered you up to me? That doesn't make sense. Jesus says in verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. The better translation of that means of this time or this age. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. It's not now. My kingdom is in the future. Pilate thought that he's getting the answer that he wanted. Oh, oh, you are a king then. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king? To this end was I born. We've seen that, haven't we, in Luke chapter 1. To this end was I born. It was the whole purpose of my birth. And for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate's the cynic and he's not interested in truth. He's not interested in listening to the Lord Jesus Christ. What is truth, he says, and goes back out to the Jews. So I don't see this guy being a problem for insurrection. But just consider what the Lord Jesus Christ has said. From the time of his birth... So the words that are spoken here, at near, almost at the time of his death, he said, my purpose in this earth has been a king to bring servants together who would listen to truth. And when it's time, they will fight to spread that truth throughout all the world. You see, in the words of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was teaching as a prophet, he hinted at what this kingdom or what this kingship of his would be like and I'd ask you to come across to Luke chapter 19 and the parable that he spoke at on this occasion he was coming to Jerusalem those that believed in him as the Messiah of that day thought that he might announce his kingship to take rulership right then and because they were coming near to Jerusalem, he wanted them to understand that it was going to be only when he returned that he would be king. You see, Luke chapter 19 and verse 11. As they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was not to Jerusalem because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Now, the use of this phrase, a certain nobleman, would almost be like what we would say in our colloquial language. I'll tell you a story about a friend of mine, when actually we might be talking about ourselves. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing here. This certain nobleman is in fact himself. And what's going to happen to that certain nobleman? He's going to go into a far country. He's going to take a journey somewhere. And in, in the story of what we understand in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to go to heaven. He's going to go to heaven while that kingdom is prepared and then he's going to return to take up that kingdom. And he's going to return as the king. And when he returns, he's going to bring a reward for those servants who have chosen truth. For those servants who have chosen to do the things that he's asked them to do. For those servants who have chosen to love God and to demonstrate that by loving their neighbour because those were the commandments that he gave. And so in his parable, he says in verse 15, it came to pass when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the work, the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. And then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained 10 pounds. And he said unto him, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little have thou authority over ten cities. The Lord had come as king. He's king over an extended domain. He's not going to be able to be the authority in every local place. He's got to have a delegated authority to those of his servants who have proved faithful. This is the reward that he is bringing to those of his servants who have followed truth 
demonstrated a love of God, demonstrated a love of their neighbour through their life, is to take his authority and to rule with him when he's king over this earth that he will return to. He's going to reign on that throne, we're told in Luke, forever. He's going to ask his servants to rule with him forever. That means those servants are going to have to live forever. They're going to have to escape death that Brad had here on the, on the board behind us. And Jesus spoke of his reward that would come for those that loved him and followed his ways and gave their lives as he did. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that life was going to be lived in the role of a teacher, of an influencer, of a priest to those people that have not yet had the chance to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ and to learn of his salvation. That's what was going to be done with that everlasting life that the Lord Jesus Christ has promised us. Opportunity for anyone who would follow him to escape death and to live forever. He spoke about his reward in a similar parable, Matthew 25 and verse 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things. Join me in my kingdom, in my rulership, and enter thou into the joy of thy Lord, that together we can rule the world and make it the place that God always wanted it to be, despite the fact that humans have got it into such a mess as we've heard already. The Lord Jesus Christ, amongst his very last words, in Revelation 22 and verse 12 said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. He's coming back here to establish a kingdom on this earth, which means that everybody will know about God and follow the truth, and all of the mess that we see around us in this world will be changed. Can we just conclude, if you don't mind turning over to Philippians chapter 2. We've seen the mortal life and influence of our Lord Jesus Christ through what Micah spoke to us about tonight. We could summarise that in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7, where the Lord Jesus Christ made himself of no reputation. He was the Son of God, but he came in the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men to show them how God would have lives lived. And we do well to follow the example that he gave us. Not only that, we've learned about his death, as Brad spoke to us about the way that that could bring life to others. And we read about that in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, that being found in the fashion as a man, having been come to this earth, as Hebrews 2 verse 14 said, sharing the same nature as all of us, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross as a symbol to show that if we've put our whole trust in, and, and our love towards God that we can overcome even if we are sinners and that God will forgive us. And he's coming to return and to bring and to, to rule as a king and to share that kingdom as his reward with all of those that would follow. And we read about that in Philippians chapter 2 from verse 9 to 11. Wherefore God also hath also, God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Lord Jesus Christ, the most influential name that has ever been and that will be. Verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee on the planet should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If we follow the influence of the Lord Jesus Christ, we allow his death and his resurrection to have an impact on our, on our lives, then we will be able to receive the reward of eternal rulership with him when he returns.
Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.